Before we get started, we're going to real quickly, really quickly go over a few things uh, from last week. For those of you who just tuned in or else who have not had a chance to listen to the tape from last week yet or whatever the case may be, just to kind of fill you in. And uh, just as this week we will have a set of names that will be sort of our highlight names, which we will talk about in a moment, um, there's a series of names from last week that would be our highlight names. And I, I guess the first and foremost, and in fact the one who pretty much led off the broadcast, was a man by the name of Eugenio Pacelli, P-A-C-E-L-L-I. And at the beginning of our broadcast uh, last week, we were reading from uh, a book called La Popesa, and it was detailing uh, an event that occurred in 1919, when at the time uh, Eugenio Pacelli was the papal nuncio, um, a, uh, a representative to Munich, Germany, on behalf of the Vatican. And at that time, Eugenio Pacelli, when the section that we, was, we were reading from the book La Popesa, Eugenio Pacelli was uh, donating a large amount of money to Adolf Hitler, who was then uh, in the early stages of forming his Nazi party, um, to go forth and fight the minions of godless communism, uh, a major concern for many high-ranking people in the Vatican then, and obviously still a major concern for many high-ranking people in the Vatican now. Now, uh, Eugenio Pacelli is, is very significant to us for a variety of reasons. Pacelli himself later became Secretary of State of the Vatican, and at that time, helped, with the aid of his brother, who was a lawyer, helped to negotiate with the Mussolini government of Italy in 1929, the Lateran Treaty, a very important treaty in that it made the Vatican a separate entity from the country of Italy. It also made uh, uh, Roman ca uh, the Roman Catholic religion the state religion of Italy, and it also separated the Vatican and its dealings from the day-to-day -day government of Italy in a variety of other ways which will become very significant tonight because many of them have to do with uh, the privacy of the Vatican from civil authority, namely Italian civil authority. And as we'll see tonight in this complex web of financial intrigue, many has been the time when the Lateran Treaty of 1929 and its separation of the Vatican from the Italian state um, has been perhaps the only refuge of certain uh, malefactors, if I can use a nice old Latinate word, uh, people doing wrong who cloaked in the uh, the separate status of the Vatican um, were able to to uh, avoid any kind of serious prosecution for crimes. Now, so again, we've got Eugenio Pacelli, who had originally been contributing to Hitler um, uh, and on behalf of anti-communism, uh, becoming the Secretary of State and uh, with his brother helping to negotiate the treaty with Mussolini's fascist government in Italy. And then uh, a little later on, Eugenio Pacelli becomes Pope Pius XII, um, the man who was to be the Pope all during World War II and the man who was basically uh, to uh, not lift a finger as fascism spread over Europe and in many cases as fascism spread over his own city of Rome, including the deportation of uh, thousands of Jews, uh, the shooting of some four or five hundred partisans in the Ar Ardeatine caves uh, on behalf of the Gestapo, um, all kinds of things, and hideous atrocities, as we heard, performed by the uh, Croatians in Yugoslavia against the Serbs, the Greek Orthodox Serbs, and, and other uh, uh, groups within that country. All of these, uh, while Pius XII did not, as, as mentioned before, make a, a single noise of protest. Even beyond that, Pius XII in 1933, as Secretary of State, before, well, the Pacelli, before he became Pius XII, helped negotiate a treaty with Nazi Germany, which instituted a state church tax in Germany, part of which went to the Vatican and derived a lot of income for the Vatican. After that, uh, in 1939, when Pius XI was on the verge of condemning Hitler for his excesses against German Catholics, uh, Pius XI conveniently died. Pius XII assumed, or Pacelli became Pius XII, and then restored good relations with Nazi Germany, in spite of the fact that uh, Hitler was savaging a good portion of the Catholic population of Germany. And uh, there also, we also looked at, possi at a possible, possible arrangement. Uh, it, it is, at this point, simply historical speculation and research uh, of a possible connection between uh, then Pius XII and American and British intelligence and the, the, the German general staff with regard to a possible or agreement to open up the Western Front in Europe during World War II to prevent the Russians from moving into Germany. And uh, perhaps, uh, for our purposes, uh, the most, one of the most important... Uh, aspects of the program last time concerned a couple of figures who we looked at in connection with the so-called rat line. The rat line was a very established, very well-established sort of underground railroad which the <coughs> Vatican, the U.S. intelligence, and the SS had set up in order to uh, funnel 
basically Nazi war criminals and Nazi fugitives from Europe to a variety of different places, primarily Latin America. Uh, the two most important names that uh, we looked at in connection with that, and uh, this, in a sense, uh, provides the transition to the broadcast this evening. One of them is a fellow named Giovanni Battista Montini, at that time a cardinal and in charge of uh, handling the uh, Vatican passports, diplomatic passports, which were given to key people to permit them to travel around the world under Vatican auspices. Many of those passports were abused when they were given to Nazis, to, not, to Nazi war criminals, to permit them to travel on Vatican auspices and uh, thereby escape punishment. And Giovanni Battista Montini eventually was to go on to become Pope Paul VI. And we'll look at uh, some of the circumstances concerning his elevation to the papacy this evening. The other key name that uh, we're going to be looking at, well, that we looked at last week and uh, that we're going to be picking up with again this evening, was a man named Licio Gelli, last name G-E-L-L-I. Gelli was an Oberleutnant in the SS during World War II. And according to a man named David Yallop, who wrote a book that we're going to be relying on largely for our broadcast this evening, that not only was Licio Gelli a, uh, a, a fugitive eventually on the rat line, the so-called rat line, but... Licio Gelli also played a key role, according to Yallop, in setting up that very same rat line from Europe to the uh, to Latin America in cooperation, not only with U.S. intelligence and the Nazis themselves, but also the Vatican. And Licio Gelli is uh, one of the main people that we're going to be looking at in the broadcast this evening. So uh, perhaps for transition purposes from last week to this week, remember Giovanni Battista Montini, later Pope, Pope Paul VI, who we saw helping the Nazis exit Europe for Latin America, and Licio Gelli, uh, a, an Oberleutnant in the SS, an SS officer, who uh, was functioning in a similar capacity and working on the same operation as Montini, although perhaps they never knew each other. There's no way of knowing. Okay. Now, again, just to continue on into the beginning of tonight's broadcast, uh, again, since so many of these names, especially in these initial broadcasts, although this will change in the next few broadcasts, uh, so many of these names in the initial broadcasts are Italian names. Um, as Dave mentioned, Giovanna, Giovanni Battista Montini, um, Montini to become Pope Paul VI will play a major part in tonight's broadcast. Licio Gelli, who will play a major part in all of our broadcasts tonight, perhaps not as much as some of the others, but he is always a presence, and uh, we will be talking about him. Um, the head of the P2, the Propaganda Due Masonic Lodge, um, and we will be talking about him more. Now, uh, four more names to keep your eye on tonight, all of which will be very important. Um, the first is Michele Sindona. Michele Sindona, probably the most important financier in this entire thing, and for a while, uh, one of the most important financiers in the world, and one of the uh, the few men with the with unique top level access to the CIA, the Vatican, and the Mafia, all the way down the line. Michele Sindona, very important tonight. Roberto Calvi, who pretty much followed in Michele Sindona's footsteps as uh, as the, the the Vatican's main banker and main um, uh, organizer of Vatican banking affairs uh, all over the world um, because, again, of the freedom largely given to the Vatican by the Lateran Treaty, and, of course, as we mentioned earlier, to an extent, the freedom from prosecution given to them by the Lateran Treaty. Um, going hand-in-hand, hand, so to speak, with, uh, with Roberto Calvi, a man by the name of Archbishop Paul Marchinkus. Paul Marchinkus, uh, probably the only uh, uh, American that we're going to see in the, in the Vatican uh, to any extent in the next few broadcasts. Paul Marchinkus, the president of the IOR, the Institute for Religious Works, otherwise known as the Vatican Bank. And last but not least, but perhaps certainly the saddest of all of the names that we're going to be running into tonight, Albino Luciani. Albino Luciani, who was once the patriarch of uh, Venice, among other things, and eventually became Pope John Paul I, and about whose death David Yallop's book, In God's Name, that we are going to be using very heavily tonight, um, uh, about whose death David Yallop has written this book. And uh, John Paul I, of course, the immediate predecessor to John Paul II, who is the current pope. John Paul I, also uh, an extremely short tenure as pope, in which he began a whole series of investigations, as we'll see, into the same tangle of financial problems in which David Yallop, as well as Dave, Emery, and myself, Nip Tuck, uh, tend to believe probably had something to do with his early departure from the papacy. Inasmuch as the fact that these investigations would have unseated many of the most powerful people in the Vatican at that time and defamed some very famous people uh, who had preceded the Pope, uh, and inasmuch in as all of his reforms were promptly deep-sixed by his death, uh, along obviously with Albino Luciani, uh, it, uh, well, I sh we should call him JP1, I guess, uh, in this context. But anyway, uh, the, uh, the curious and untimely death of Pope John Paul I 
uh, may very well have been one of a number of obvious murders and, and quote, suicides, unquote, which we will begin looking at this evening. Uh, I guess you could you could look at the P2 Lodge, and we're going to take up just what the P2 is here in just a second. You could look at the P2 Lodge as a top 40 radio station. The hits just keep on coming, and if that sounds a bit exaggerated, well, stick with us, because not only this evening, but uh, during the rest of these broadcasts, we're going to be detailing a, a very depressing uh, series of murders and uh, very curious deaths. And uh, the, the question is, and that David Yallop asks, asks and uh, Nip and I feel answers in the affirmative very well. Basically, uh, he asks, was Pope John Paul I one of these P2-related deaths? Okay, now first off tonight, we're going to start with um, an investigation of the P2. And the P2 is going to be kind of a shadow framework tonight for much of the broadcast, although the, the specific workings of the P2 will not be as prevalent as they will in some other broadcasts. Um, the P2, of course... Uh, the Propaganda Due Masonic Lodge. I'm not going to explain it right now because it's explained in this section very, fairly well. But again, um, the key, the key, uh, the kingpin player in this first part, and when we're talking about the Masonic Lodge, is Licio Jelly. We talked at some length about him last week. As Dave mentioned, uh, the man who was to a large extent, uh, if not the instigator, one of the key uh, uh, instrumenters, I guess, or however you'd put that, of the rat line that got the Nazis out of Europe, one of the first people to make that contact probably, between um, U.S. intelligence and the Vatican work uh, to getting uh, work toward getting the Nazis to safety. And, of course, because of that, himself a large beneficiary of various of the SS money-making schemes, like the ones we talked about, such as Operation Bernhardt, the massive counterfeiting scheme, and things of that nature. And immediately after the war, uh, Jelly made his mark by, by uh, basically playing both sides against the middle, by informing on virtually anybody he could inform on, uh, meanwhile, tightening his contacts into um, into the uh, the right wing uh, world of Italian politics, and specifically into the uh, basically the unrepentant fascists in the Italian body politic, and that of course has been where Licio Gelli has made his fortune, and uh, wherever he is today, he is currently on the run, as we'll talk about in a later broadcast. Um, Licio Gelli probably is still operating off the same series of contacts that he began uh, before World War II. Okay, we're going to start with a section from In God's Name, subtitled An Investigation into the Murder of Pope John Paul I by David A. Yallop. This book is copyright 1984 by Bantam Books. Again, he's speaking of Licio Gelli. Gelli joined a conventional Masonic lodge in November 1963. He rapidly rose to third-degree membership, which made him eligible to lead a lodge. The then Grand Master, Giordano Gambarini, urged Jelly to form a circle of important people, some of whom might eventually become Masons, but all of whom could be useful to the growth of legitimate Freemasonry. Jelly leaped at the opportunity. What he in fact conceived was an illegal secret organization. This group was given the name Raggruppamento Jelly, P2. The P stood for Propaganda, the name of, an, of a historic lodge of the 19th century. Initially, he brought into it retired senior members of the armed forces, through them, he obtained access to active service heads. The web he spun was gradually to cover the entire power structure of Italy. The ideals and aspirations of genuine Freemasonry were rapidly abandoned, though not officially. Jelly's aim was somewhat different, extreme right-wing control of Italy. Such control would function as a secret state within a state, unless the unthinkable happened and the communists were elected to power. If that happened, then there would be a coup the right wing would take over. Jelly was confident that the Western powers would accept the situation. Indeed, from the very early days of P2, he had the active support and encouragement of the CIA operating in Italy. It may sound like the scenario of a madman, doomed to the fate of all such schemes, but it should be noted that within the membership of P2 in Italy alone, there were, and still are, powerful branches in other countries, were the armed forces commander, Giovanni Torrisi, the secret service chiefs, Generals Giuseppe Santavito and Giulio Grissini, the head of Italy's financial police, Orazio Giannini, cabinet ministers and politicians of every political shade, except, of course, the communists, 30 generals, 8 admirals, newspaper editors, television executives, top businessmen and bankers, including Roberto Calvi and Michele Sindona. Unlike conventional Freemasonry, the list of members of P2 was secret. Only Jelly knew all the names. Before I go on, let me just point out something again really quickly. They talk about the fact that 
um, early on in uh, from the very early days of P2 that Lee Sergelli had the active support and encouragement of the CIA operating in Italy. Okay, now this is important for a variety of reasons, not just for the facile reason of trying to blame this all on the CIA, as people have accused us of doing in the past and uh, with very little validity because we're very careful about trying to assign a sult ultimate blame in these things. The reason it's very important, though, is that a um, couple of broadcasts up the line here, when the shooting of the Pope takes place, of John Paul II takes place, that the very first people on the line with the Bulgarian uh, conspiracy theory that received such worldwide play that to this day is basically what most people think of when they hear about the attempted shooting of John Paul II. In other words, it's uh, a lie that has become fact in the minds of many. The very people who started this rumor were almost all of them um, former uh, CIA uh, contract or, or involved or affiliated journalists who had operated in Italy, people like Claire Sterling and Michael Ledeen. These are the people who started it. So it's interesting and important to note that the CIA was involved with Propaganda Due from very early on because they managed very early on to, uh, in the after the attempted assassination of John Paul, to have their assets in place to perpetuate exactly the story that Licio Gelli's P2 Lodge, an almost overtly fascist, or an overtly fascist organization, wanted told. Okay, so that's important to note. Anyway, going ahead with David Yallop's book. Gelli used a variety of techniques to obtain new members and increase the power of P2. One of them was the innocuous method of personal contact and introduction from an already existing member. Others were less tasteful. Blackmail was the most prevalent. When a target joined P2. He was obliged to demonstrate loyalty by placing at Jelly's disposal documents that would compromise not only himself, but also other possible targets. Confronted with the evidence of their own misdeeds, these new targets also joined P2. This technique was used, for example, on the president of ENI, Ente Nazionale Hidrocarburi, the state oil company, Giorgio Mazzanti. Shown the evidence of his own corruption concerning proposed huge bribes and payoffs on a pending Saudi oil deal, Mazzanti caved in and joined P2, bringing to Jelly even more compromising information. Another technique Jelly used to obtain a new member was to ascertain from already corrupted sources the short list of candidates for important jobs. He would then telephone these candidates, announcing to each that he intended to fix it for him. Naturally, one of the candidates would be hired, and Jelly would then have a very grateful new member of P2. On the surface, P2 was, and still is, a fanatical insurance policy against potential communist governments. Excluding Italy, there are still branches functioning in Argentina, Venezuela, Paraguay, Bolivia, France, Portugal, and Nicaragua. Members are even active in Switzerland and the United States. Moreover, P2 interlocks with the Mafia in Italy, Cuba, and the United States. It interlocks with a number of the military regimes of Latin America, and with a variety of groups of neo-fascists. It also interlocks very closely with the CIA. It reaches right into the heart of the Vatican. Apparently, the central common interest of all these elements is a hatred and fear of communism. In fact, P2 is not a world conspiracy with the aim of preventing the spread of Marxism or its many variations. It is an international group with a number of diverse aims. It combines an attitude it combines an attitude of mind with a community of self-interest, its main goals being not the destruction of, of, of a particular ideology, but the acquisition of unlimited power and wealth and the furtherance of self. These goals hide behind the acceptable face of, quote, defenders of the free world. In the world of P2, however, nothing is free. Everything has a price. Okay, before we go along again, just to point that out, they're talking about active branches still in all those countries, Argentina, Venezuela, Paraguay, Bolivia, France, Portugal, Nicaragua, also Switzerland and the United States where there, uh, there's activity and interlocking with the mafia and the CIA and neo-fascists all over the world. This is exactly we're gonna, what we're going to be documenting in the next shows. Right, exactly. Next week we're going to be talking <laughs> about the international connections of P2, also some of its fascist machinations. While uh, I think Gallup's point here is very well taken, that the P2, above all else, is uh, out for the betterment, betterment of the P2, and uh, even then primarily of Licio Jelly, and that a lot of P2 people have wound up very badly off as a result of their association <coughs> with it. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, as anti-communist as it is, and as dogmatically anti-communist as it is, that anti-communism for the P2 is really a means to an end. And in this sense, and perhaps Jelly's SS membership uh, <laughs> is to be borne in mind here, 
in the sense it's like the uh, Nazis themselves, who, unlike Mussolini's fascism, which was a pure anti-communist ideology, anti-communism, although doctrinaire and Nazism, was really, as much as anything, a means to an end. The Nazis were able to gain much of the favor that they uh, met around the world because of their anti-communism, and uh, they used that to further their pan-Germanic aims. P2 is like the Nazi party in that regard. Indeed, and of course the Nazis to this day, many of whom are still actively or at least uh, uh, were actively involved up until a few years ago, since some of them are starting to get pretty old, uh, in our own security establishment was, again, because they played the anti-communism card. And, of course, that is how uh, Licio Gelli was, in, was able to uh, enlist the help of many of the American intelligence people and military intelligence people to get these Nazis out of Europe back during the time of the Rat Line. Licio Gelli's contacts and associates eventually spread far and wide. They included Stefano Della Chiai, Pier Luigi Pagliani, and Joachim Fiebelkorn, all members of the private army set up in Bolivia by ex-Gestapo chief Klaus Barbie. The group took the name Fiancés of Death. Political assassinations were performed to order, including that of Bolivian socialist leader Marcelo Quiroga Cruz. The Fiancés of Death were also instrumental in bringing to power in Bolivia in 1980 General Garcia Meza. Klaus Barbie put his Nazi training to good use as security advisor to Colonel Luis Gomez, a man with a great deal of Bolivian blood on his hands. The group that Barbie controlled with the blessing of the Bolivian junta expanded its activities after the coup of 1980. The murders of political opponents, investigating journalists, labor leaders, and students increased. Added to this work was the task of, quote, regulating the cocaine industry, destroying the small dealers to ensure that the big drug traffickers could flourish with the junta's protection. And from 1965 on, Barbie's activities in Bolivia had included arms deals not only on behalf of Bolivia, but also for other right-wing South American regimes and, incredibly, Israel. It was through such arms deals that Klaus Barbie, an unrepentant member of the SS, and Licio Gelli, and parenthetically, uh, we should insert uh, Licio Gelli also, as we mentioned before, an Oberleutnant in the SS, uh, Klaus Barbie and Licio Gelli became business partners. Barbie, the man who between May 1940 and April 1942 was responsible for all the, for the liquidation of all known Freemasons in Amsterdam, and Licio Gelli, the Grand Master of Masonic Lodge, P2. The two men had much in common, including the high regard in which they held men such as Stefano Della Chiai. The Italian Della Chiai has been involved in at least two attempted coups in his own country. When a civilian government returned to office in Bolivia in October 1982, Della Chiai fled to Argentina. There he was given comfort and aid by P2 member Jose Lopez Rega, the creator of the notorious AAA death squads, as well as of a large cocaine smuggling connection between Argentina and the United States. Clearly, Licio Gelli is as skillful at selling his particular vision of the world as he was once selling mattresses. To have a range of close friends and associates that include a man such as Jose Lopez Rega, as well as Klaus Barbie, and the enigmatic Cardinal Paolo Bertoli is a considerable achievement. Like Jelly, the Cardinal is a Tuscan. His career includes 40 years in the Vatican, in the Vatican Diplomatic Service. Bertoli was not without support in the conclave that elected Albino Luciani, who, of course, as we mentioned before, became John Paul I. We're going to come back to Cardinal Bertoli here in a second, continuing with the Allop's account of the P2. The list of P2 members grew ever larger. In 1981, when a huge quantity of Jelly's secret documents were seized in Tuscany, they revealed that the secret society had nearly a thousand members in Italy alone. But those thousand are merely the tip of the iceberg. The SISMI, S-I-S-M-I, Italy's military intelligence agency, puts Italian membership at nearly 2,000. Jelly himself puts the figure at 2,400. In either event, a number of Europe's intelligence agencies agree that the identity of the majority of P2 members has yet to be revealed, and that within their ranks are, well, let's see, I must have... Within their ranks are nearly 300 of the most powerful men in what, it ple in what it pleases the 20th century to call the free world. When the Italian exposure of nearly a 1,000 members of this illegal secret society occurred in 1981, one P2 member, Senator Fabrizio Cicito, C-I-C-C-H-I-T-T-O, stated a fundamental truth. If you wanted to make it to the top in Italy in the 1970s, the best way was jelly in P2. The close relationship between P2 and the Vatican was like all relationships formed by Jelly, self-serving to both parties. Jelly played on the almost paranoid fear of communism within the Vatican. He was particularly given to quoting pre-Second World War statements which had justified fascism 
including one by Cardinal Hinsley of Westminster, who had told Catholics in 1935, quote, If fascism goes under, God's cause goes under with it. Of course, that's a sentiment we saw echoed by a lot of people, notably uh, then Cardinal and eventually uh, Cardinal Pacelli, eventually Pius XII. So uh, again, uh, to pick up that one sentence that I dropped there, which sort of sums up the P2 on an international scale, in either event, a number of Europe's intelligence agencies agree that the identity of the majority of P2 members has yet to be revealed and that within their ranks are nearly 300 of the most powerful men in what it pleases the 20th century to call the free world. An international power base, we're going to be looking primarily at its operations in Italy this evening and specifically its influence upon the Vatican finances. Okay. Now, you remember just a moment ago uh, where we left, left off with the last section before, um, we were talking about Licio Gelli and among his contacts being... Cardinal Albin, uh, Cardinal Bertoli, Cardinal Bertoli, a uh, man with 40 years experience in the Vatican diplomatic service. Continuing with David Yallops in God's name, Cardinal Bertoli was only one of the many quote doors to Jelly's entry into the Vatican. Jelly dined with Bishop Paul Marcinkus, and since we're going to be using this name a lot, I'm going to spell it M A R C I N K U S. He had a number of audiences with Pope Paul, many a cardinal, archbishop. Bishop, Monsignor, and priest, who today would deny all knowledge of Licio Gelli, was only too pleased to be seen in his company in the 1960s and the 1970s. One of Gelli's closest associates was, an, was Italian lawyer and businessman Umberto Ortolani. Like the Puppet Master, which is a nickname for Licio Gelli, Ortolani learned early in life the value of secret information. During the Second World War, he became head of two large operational units of SISMI, S-I-S-M-I, the military intelligence service in Italy. His specialty was counter-espionage. A Roman Catholic, he appreciated while still a young man that one of the real centers of power was across the Tiber, within Vatican City. His penetration of the Vatican and its corridors of influence was total. Vatican dignitaries were frequent dinner guests at Ortolani's Rome house on Via Archimedi. An indication of how far back Ortolani's excellent Vatican contacts reached can be gauged from the fact that he was first introduced to Cardinal Giacomo Lercaro in 1953. Lercaro had immense influence within the church and was destined to become one of the four, quote, moderators of the Second Vatican Council. He was widely regarded as one of the liberal enlightened influences that helped to ensure that many of the reforms flowing from the council became realities. Ortolani was generally known as the Cardinal's cousin, a misconception he actively encouraged. In the prelude to the conclave that elected Paul VI, the central issue was whether the work of Pope John XXIII would continue or whether the papacy should revert to the reactionary ethos of Pius XII. The liberals needed a safe house to debate strategy. Lercaro, one of the liberal frontrunners, asked Ortolani to host the meeting. It was held at Ortolani's villa in Grotta Ferrata, near, the, uh, near Rome, a few days before the conclave. A large number of cardinals attended, including Soinins of Brussels, Deppner of Munich, Koenig of Vienna, Alfrink of Holland, and, of course, Cousin Lercaro. This highly secret meeting was the single most important factor in what subsequently occurred in the conclave. It was agreed that if Lercaro's very considerable support should prove insufficient, then his votes should swing to Giovanni Battista Montini. Thus... On the third ballot, Montini suddenly found himself 20 additional votes nearer to the papacy he eventually acquired. Within months, the new pope bestowed on Umberto Ortolani the Vatican Award of Gentleman of His Holiness, unquote. He subsequently received many more Vatican honors and awards. He even succeeded in affiliating Licio Gelli, a non-Catholic, to the Knights of Malta and the Holy Sepulchre. A close friend of Casaroli, that's Agostino Casaroli, who I believe is still the uh, Vatican uh, Secretary, Secretary of, State. of State to this day. A close friend of Casaroli, the man usually referred to as the Vatican's Kissinger because of his major involvement in foreign policy, lawyer Ortolani provided his P2 master with an unrivaled entree into any part of the Vatican. Like his master, Ortolani is a man who, on paper at least, it is, is a citizen of many countries. Born in Viterbo in Italy, he has since become a Brazilian national. A useful byproduct of that arrangement is that no extradition treaty exists between Italy and Brazil. Okay, now before we go on from here, I want to just point out something and to make a sort of a general um, uh, analogy to what, what uh, something that happened here. Now, uh, as mentioned before in, in this last section here, they talked about the fact that Umberto Ortolani, 
who is, uh, again, a very close jelly associate who's currently, as they said, uh, you know, became a Brazilian national because of the extradition, or not because necessarily, but it's certainly a convenient thing. Um, that Ortolani was a major player in the, uh, I guess you'd call it, uh, in the crowning of Pope, uh, of Pope Paul VI. Now, one of the interesting things about Pope Paul VI becoming the Pope is, as they mention, that initially he was thought to be an alternative to the um, uh, the front-running liberal uh, at that time, which was Lercaro. One of the very interesting things, I think there's a very strong analogy to be made to people who are not familiar with papal politics to what happened, um, although in, in the case of, uh, of America it was caused by assassination, but what happened with John F. Kennedy. Now, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, Lyndon Johnson was was felt by many people to be the uh, the alternative and was going to uh, was going to carry on the liberal um, work of John F. Kennedy in much the same way. John the Twenty Third, who of course was the sponsor of Vatican II, which was the most uh, striking liberalization of the Catholic Church to that time. Um, Pope Paul the Sixth was thought by some to be somebody who would carry on the liberal traditions, and of course this did not turn out to be the case. And in fact, as far as finances and contact with um, the, Italy's right-wing community, uh, Pope Paul the Sixth, the former again, the former Giovanni Battista Montini, the man who had been um, in charge of the office of, uh, of passports and documents um, at the time that the rat line was getting Nazis out of Europe on Vatican passports. Um, uh, Pope Paul VI turned out to be, of course, not quite that liberal at all, um, and it's it's rather interesting again that that this kind of thing would happen that everybody would be set up for this guy to come in, um, be thought of as being an, a you know a liberal pope to carry on the work, and he did give a lot of lip service to carrying on the great work of John the Twenty Third, but in reality the forces of retrenchment were already involved, and one cannot help but believe that somebody like Umberto Ortolani probably had a pretty good idea before um, helping to get. Uh, the support thrown to Pope Paul VI, what kind of a man he was dealing with. And if he was a friend of Licio Gelli's, who worked with, as far as we know, with Montini on the rat line, um, then it's a very good possibility that Umberto Ortolani knew exactly who he was dealing with. Again, Licio Gelli in the SS, Montini in the Vatican, both working together on the rat line. Then, Licio Gelli heads up, or basically founds, establishes the P2 Lodge. <coughs> a key member of the P2 Lodge is Umberto Ortolani, a former uh, officer with Italian intelligence during the Second World War, working for Mussolini. And the aforementioned Umberto Ortolani plays a key role in electing Cardinal Montini, Pope Paul VI. Now, eventually, as we're about to look at, Pope Paul VI goes on to uh, usher many, uh, well, basically to establish a very close working relationship between the Vatican Bank and the P2 Lodge. And uh, so recalling now, not only the old association of Montini and Jelly on the rat line, although we don't know if they actually saw each other uh, or dealt with each other, they certainly were working on the same project at the same time. And then the subsequent influence of Umberto Ortolani of the P2 on the election of Paul VI it's uh, worth taking a, a good close look at the ushering in of M Michele Sindona and Roberto Calvi of the P2 to handle Vatican finances along with uh, Marchinkas and so forth, uh, or Bishop Marchinkas and some other people we're going to talk about here, I should say. Uh, basically, the uh, the role played by Licio, by, by uh, Umberto Ortolani and uh, Licio Gelli in establishing Montini as Paul VI is worth uh, keeping in mind here as we proceed through the, the maze of Vatican politics. Now, basically, uh, the association between Pope Paul VI and Michele Sindona, a key P2 member who we're going to look at right now, occurred basically because, uh, as a result, again, of the tremendous amount of money that had come to the Vatican as a result of the Lateran Treaty and the investments that were made on, on behalf of the Vatican by a man named Bernardino Nogara, N-O-G-A-R-A, who we looked at last time, the Vatican came into a lot of wealth. It had always had a lot of influence and a certain amount of wealth, the Vatican basically became a large-scale business enterprise, and indeed, uh, David Yalla refers to the Vatican's finances as Vatican Incorporated, and it's uh, an appropriate term to use here. When Paul VI, uh, basically, he, he wanted to do a couple of things. Uh, the huge amount of wealth that had accrued to the Vatican was proving quite embarrassing for what was known, as the Catholic Church has been known, as the Church of the Poor, unquote. On top of that, the tax-exempt status that the Vatican had always, uh, that the Vatican's investments had enjoyed under, uh, the, uh, under the Lateran Treaty was being seriously challenged by the, in fact, was being done away with by the Italian government. Very simply, the Vatican absorbed such a large amount of uh, Italy's finances that it simply was weakening the Italian economy and making life very difficult 
for the majority of Italians to have the Vatican enjoying this uh, privileged fiscal position. The Vatican's dividend, the, the dividends earned off its investments were not taxable under the Italian law. And because of that, Italian law was changed, and the Vatican, in order to maintain its uh, economic and financial hegemony, basically invested abroad. It took its investments out of Italy where they could be taxed and began investing them abroad, uh, ostensibly to uh, earn more money and also, uh, in, in, in effect, to lower the visibility of the Vatican wealth. Now, Michele Sendona of the P2 Lodge was the man brought in by Pope Paul VI to uh, serve as a, a, a financial advisor to the Vatican. And again, he works very closely here with Archbishop Paul Marchinkus. Returning to In God's Name by David Yallop. Michele Sendona was the man chosen by Pope Paul VI to act as a financial advisor to the Vatican. The man chosen after a long friendship with the Pope to relieve the Church of its high-profile business position in Italy. The plan was to sell Sendona some of the major assets acquired under Nagara. Vatican Incorporated was about to distance itself from the unacceptable face of capitalism. Theoretically, it was going to embrace the philosophy contained in the message Pope Paul VI gave the world in his 1967 encyclical Populorum Progressio. Quote, God has destined the earth and all it contains for the use of all men and all peoples so that the goods of creation must flow in just proportion into the hands of everybody according to the rule of justice which is inseparable from charity. All other rights of whatever kind, including those of private property and of free trade, must be subordinated to it. They must not obstruct, but on the contrary foster its achievement. And it is a grave and urgent social duty to restore them to their original aims. Unquote. When that statement was uttered, the Vatican was the biggest owner of private real estate in the world. Re repeating that sentence again. When that statement was uttered, the Vatican was the biggest owner of private real estate in the world. Popularum Progressio also contained the memorable observation that even when entire populations are suffering massive injustice, revolutionary insurrection is not the answer. Quote, one cannot fight a real evil at the cost of a greater evil, unquote. Confronted with the problem of the evil of a wealthy Roman Catholic Church when he apparently desired a poor church for the poor, the Pope and his advisors decided to liquidate a sizable proportion of the Vatican's Italian assets and reinvest in other countries. Thus, they would avoid heavy taxation, and the yield on the investment would be better. When Pope Paul proclaimed the magnificent aspirations of Populorum Progressio in 1967, Vatican and Incorporated had already for a number of years been a close working partner of Michele Sindona. Through the illegal flight of currency from Sindona's Italian banks via the Vatican Bank to the Swiss bank that they jointly owned, Sindona and the Vatican, if not perhaps making the goods of creation flow to the poor, were certainly making them flow out of Italy. By early 1968, another Vatican-controlled bank, the Banco Unione, was in trouble. The Vatican Bank owned approximately 20%. It was represented on the board of directors by Massimo Spada, S-P-A-D-A, and Luigi Manini, M-E-N-N-I-N-I. -N -N -I. Two names to remember for later, by the way. At that point, Sindona came in and bought control. Two years later, with the Vatican still substantial part owners, the, the, the bank became, in theory, an astonishing success. Because it was now aiming at the small saver and offering higher interest rates, the bank saw its deposits rise from $35 million to over $150 million. That was the theory. In practice, during the same period, the bank was robbed of over $250 million by Sindona and his associates. Most of this fortune was poured through yet another Sindona bank, the Amencor Bank of Zurich. Much was lost in wild speculation on the silver market. One of the men who was deeply impressed with Sindona at this time was David Kennedy, chairman of Continental Illinois Bank, soon to be appointed Treasury Secretary in the Nixon Cabinet. And I would add that in our next program, we're going to talk about the international connections of P2, including key American connections, at greater length than we are now. Continuing with Yallop's account. By 1969, it was clear to Vatican Incorporated that it had lost the long battle with the Italian government over taxation of dividends. Realizing that to unload its entire stock on the market would result in the possible collapse of the Italian economy, it occurred to the Vatican that such an action would also be self-defeating. A collapse of that magnitude would result in staggering Vatican losses. The Pope, in conjunction with the now Cardinal Sergio Gheri, head of the Special Administration of the APSA, decided to un... Uh, let me read that sentence again. The Pope... In conjunction with the now Cardinal Sergio Rogeri, head of the Special Administration of the APSA, that's a Vatican financial institution that we're going to talk about later, decided to unload from the Italian portfolio a major asset, the Vatican's share in the giant Società Generale Immobiliari. With assets of over half a billion dollars scattered around the world, 
That was certainly highly visible wealth. They again sent for the shark. By the way, the shark is a nickname that uh, Michele Sendona acquired. There's another nickname we're going to talk about later is the knight. That is Roberto Calvi. And the first one we mentioned was the puppet master, the puppeteer, who is Licio Jelly. So those are the main nicknames you have to keep in mind. Right. The shark is Sendona here. The shares of Società Generale Immobiliare were selling at about 350 lira. The Vatican held directly and indirectly some 25% of the 143 million shares. Would Sindona like to buy? The question was put by Cardinal Gueri. That, by the way, is G-U-E-R-R-I. Sindona's response was immediate and positive. He would take the lot. At 700 lira each, double the market price. Gueri and Pope Paul were delighted. The agreement between Sindona and Gueri was signed at a secret midnight meeting in the Vatican in the spring of 1969. For the Vatican, this was a particularly good meeting. It also wished to unload its majority share of Condati d'Aqua, Rome's water company, and its controlling share of Ceramica Pozzi, a chemical and porcelain company that was losing money. The shark smiled, agreed on a price, and snapped up both holdings. Precisely who had conceived this entire transaction? Who was the man who collected a handsome commission from Sindona and high praise from Pope Paul VI and Cardinal Gary? The answer is powerful evidence of not only how far P2 had penetrated the Vatican, but also how the interests of P2, the Mafia, and the Vatican were often identical. Licio Gelli's number two, Umberto Ortolani, was the man responsible for arranging the mammoth transaction. All Sindona had to do now was pay for it. It is easy to pur purchase massive companies if, were you, if you were using other people's money. Sindona's initial payment was made entirely with money illegally converted from the deposits of Banca Privata Finanziaria. In the last week of May of 1969, Sindona transferred $5 million to a small Zurich bank, the Private Credit Bank. The Privat, uh, Privat Credit Bank, probably. The Zurich bank was instructed to send the money back to BPF for the account of Mapusi Beteiligung. Uh, Beteiligung. That's B-E-T-E-I-L-I-G-U-N-G. Mabusi resided in a post office box in the Liechtenstein capital of Vaduz and was a company controlled by Sindona. From there, it was transferred again to another Sindona-controlled company, Mabusi Italiana. From there, the $5 million were paid to the Vatican. Further money was raised to pay for the huge acquisitions by br bringing in Hambros, that's an international commercial bank, and the American giant Gulf and Western. <clears throat> Sindona obviously has a highly developed sense of humor. One of the companies owned by Gulf and Western is Paramount, and one of their most successful films of the period was the adaptation of Mario Puzo's book, The Godfather. Thus, a film taking a highly glamorous and amoral look at the world of the mafia produced enormous profits, some of which went to sustain Michele Sindona, financial advisor to the mafia families Gambino and Inzerillo. They, in turn, were channeling the multi-million dollar profits acquired largely from heroin dealing into Sindona's banks. The circle was complete. Life was imitating art. By the early 1970s, the massive illegal flight of money from Italy was having a serious effect on the economy. Sindona and Marcinkus might be making significant profits through their efforts at diverting this money out of Italy, but the effect on the lira was devastating. Unemployment rose, the cost of living increased. Uncaring, Sindona and his associates continued to play the markets. By pushing up the price of shares to a much inflated level, the Sindona banks went through millions of dollars of other people's money.